My name is Carrie Banks. I work with the uh, Riverways program in the Department of Fishing Game. And tonight we're going to be talking about what makes a healthy river and to give you some tips and clues on what you'll be looking for while you're walking your stream segments. And the goal is to, again, make this interactive and fun. So uh, I'll be throwing up different images and hopefully you'll be helping me along as, as we take our tours of the river. I'm going to be talking about why rivers matter, why, why rivers and streams are really important for everything that we do, really. What makes a river healthy? And then sort of some of the shoreline survey tips and tools that you'll be using as you go and walk your river segments and conduct what we call the visual survey. So why do rivers matter? Well, there's a lot of different services that our aquatic ecosystems provide. They provide wildlife habitat, food, biodiversity. They help keep our soils fertile, fresh water flows. They deliver nutrients. They help filter out pollutants. They are usually a, a source of water supply. They also help recharge groundwater. They also help with flood mitigation, surprisingly. They cause floods, but the way rivers function normally actually help prevent flooding. And they provide a, a variety of recreational opportunities and socioeconomic benefits. So what makes a river healthy? Any guesses? What do you think makes a river healthy? Clean water. Clean water? Yep. Clean yep. Yep. And aquatic life. Aquatic life. Well, there's actually a whole bunch of things that we'll be talking about. I think one of the most important things is that in order to have a healthy river, you need to have water flowing. And some of our river scientists will talk about what we call the flow regime. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's basically the seasonal and yearly variations in flow that you see. Having clean water, water quality, having habitat. We, we like to talk about habitat complexity we, and keeping it messy. You probably have heard from your mom when uh, she looks at your bedroom sometimes and you know she sees a big mess piling up. She may say something like, you know how many critters could be living in there? Well, that's why we like messy habitat. <laughs> having connected ecosystems, having the ability for fish, wildlife, water, sediment, nutrients, being able to flow through the system, the importance of riparian buffers and trees along the stream. We also talk about the, the ability of the river to move sediment and water and other materials through the system and sort of that dynamic stability that the river seeks and I'll, I'll have a couple slides that demonstrate that. And I think another thing that's important that we often forget is how is the community interacting with the river? Some of you may remember back before the Clean Water Act was passed in the 1970s, a lot of communities turned their back towards the river. It's where the sewage was dumped, it's where the industrial discharges occurred. But nowadays a lot of fo folks and a lot of communities are trying to revitalize the rivers. And I think it's really important to have local river stewards like you. We have over 10,000 miles of rivers and streams here in Massachusetts, and there's no way that we'd be able to assess them all by ourselves. So having folks out there and, and helping us sort of catalog and see what's going on is important. So what is a watershed? I kind of think of it like a big bathtub. You turn on the shower, the ridge of the bathtub, or in this case, the ridge of the mountains, define where the water's flowing, and usually down to a single point like the river, or sometimes a lake or, or a pond. In Massachusetts, we have over 27 major watersheds, and within each of the watersheds, we also have what we refer to as sub-watersheds. So as I mentioned before, the most important thing to have in your river is water. And I also mentioned this, thing, this terminology, the flow regime. In the flow regime, we're thinking about a couple different things that are occurring. We're, we're trying to figure out what time of year the flows are happening. So typically this time of year in the spring we'll have the higher flows. This is actually a time of year that salmon and other migratory fish are triggered to begin moving to their spawning grounds by the higher flows. During the summer months the river flows will drop and that will trigger other uh, critters and other fish to start seeking refuge in the colder waters. So the frequency of change, when you may have seen a hydrograph similar to this one if you've ever looked at any of the USGS hydrographs. And you may see that there's a lot of ups and downs on that. If it's happening too frequently, you know, little critters like a mayfly nymph that's latching on to the rocks and stuff in the river may have difficulty if their water keeps going up and down. Rate of change, 
how quickly is the water going up or down. If it drops too quickly, a fish may not be able to find the habitat that it needs before the warmer temperatures move in. And how long between the different peaks that we're, we're seeing um, is also another important feature. And then of course the magnitude. We can see really extreme droughts or we can see really extreme floods and both of those have different influences on our aquatic systems. So let's take a look at a stream to show you an example of how flows change throughout the year. This is Danforth Brook. It's actually a tributary of the uh, Assabet River. And if you look at that rock, you can see the red arrow pointing down. That, you can use that as a reference as we go through this slide. But this is late winter. This is probably about the time of year that um, we're in right now. We usually have the snow melt. The trees and vegetation aren't out yet, so they're not really soaking up the water. And so this is when we typically see our higher flows. As you uh, get into early spring, again, you'll have April showers that we're seeing now, and the water levels, again, are continuing to be high. And then in the summer, when the vegetation is completely out, you begin to see that the water levels will begin to drop. We have longer periods of or dry periods, and water levels begin to, to go down. But what if you saw this? What would you think? not much water in here. One of the first things that disappears as the water levels drop are what we call riffle habitat. And riffles are where the water gets oxygenated. It's usually, if you're looking at a stream, it's the little area where you see a lot of the bumps and the waves. That's where a lot of the oxygen is introduced to the river. And so because it's the shallowest part of the river, that usually disappears first. And you get these isolated pockets of water. And what happens is, is that fish and other critters that get stuck in those isolated pockets, they're very vulnerable to predators, so they have no place to go if somebody shows up and is hungry and wants dinner. The temperatures can rise very quickly in those, those small isolated pockets. And of course, because it's not getting, the water's not getting reoxygenated, the oxygen can be used up very quickly. What does our typical water budget in an area um, consist of? And in an area like the Westfield, where we have a lot of area that's pretty well vegetated up in the upper portions, um, a lot of forested area, um, this is typically the annual, annual water budget that we may see in the watershed, where you have about 37% of the water being used in evaporation and transpiration, which is the trees and vegetation sort of soaking it up and breathing it out. You may have a little bit of surface flow, surface runoff, which not, not very big, or even less than 1% of the water budget. You may have just some subsurface flow, which actually helps feed our rivers and streams, about 25%. And then the rest of the, veg or the, rest of the water actually gets soaked up into the ground. And there you can see this is about 36%. So I'm going to switch over to a slide that talks about a watershed area that's more developed, more urban, maybe down as you're getting down towards the Westfield area. And what I want you to take a look at is the number that changes with the groundwater and the number that changes with the surface runoff. Again, this is our urbanized land cover. What do you see happen? More surface runoff. It's a lot more surface runoff. So the, the previous one was just less than 1% uh, uh, or 0.3%, and now it's over 30%. And the groundwater recharge is dramatically lower. So basically, as you get into a more urban area, what you're seeing is the runoff after a storm particularly is much more dramatic, much faster. We call it a flashier part of the watershed. And what happens is that water just surges off. Less water is um, infiltrated into the ground for groundwater storage. And some of the issues that arise from this is that in summer months, as the water levels are normally dropping in our streams, often what's feeding our streams is the groundwater. And sort of that balance begins to, to fall down when you get more urban. So what can cause some unnatural flows in your, in your stream? Lawn irrigation. We have a picture of one of our stream team members standing in a stream river, or dry riverbed. And he tells us in his report that he turns around and he could see everybody with their water sprinklers on watering their yard. Transferring water out of what we call interbasin transfers or transferring water out of the watershed. So Aquabin is a good example. The Aquabin Reservoir is in the Chicopee watershed, but a lot of that water gets transferred out to the Boston metropolitan area. Pumping for drinking water or other water supplies via wells. 
inflow and infiltration, that's probably some terms that you haven't heard before, but inflow and infiltration is referring to where you may have a sewer pipe and a water pipe or, or a storm drain pipe and a water pipe laid down near each other. And what happens is, is that you may get a crack in the water pipe and the water escapes out and you lose a lot of water. It doesn't actually get used for anything. Dams, the way that dams are managed, we had another stream team that was seeing abnormal flows and it turned out the dam trash rack would get filled up with leaves each day and the stream would go almost completely dry during the day and then when the dam manager came out in the evening and raked back the leaves, the water levels would come back up. So how those are getting managed can, can affect the water flows. Um, and of course, as I mentioned in the previous slides, the, the increase of what we call impervious surfaces or areas where the water can't infiltrate into the ground but instead runs off like parking lots and roofs and roadways. This is just a couple diagrams that kind of show the, in, the effects of uh, pumping on streams. Here we have our normal stream. You can see that the water table, especially during the summer, is helping feed the, the flow in the stream. And if you insert a, a, a pumping well, what happens is you begin drawing some of that water up into the pump and you actually begin to reverse the flows. And if you, what happens is as you're depleting that well or going further down into the groundwater to get your water, that, that could be, become a complete reversal where it's actually pulling water off of the stream. And that's when it, we end up with our dry stream beds. This is um, the Ipswich River here on the right, um, which is the poster child here in Massachusetts for having um, abnormally low flows. I think for the last 10 summers, um, it's gone dry at least eight times. So obviously has a huge impact not only on recreation, but also the aquatic habitat that we talked about before. So the other thing that we mentioned that makes a healthy river is what the water quality is like. Our waterways are usually classified as Class A or suitable for drinking water or Class B waters, which are usually um, used for recreational, either primary contact, which is basically swimming, or secondary contact, which may be fishing or boating. When we go out and we try to figure out whether they're meeting those class, class A or Class B standards, there's a variety of things that we take a look at. And some of them can get uh, much more scientific than others. And I know that a lot of my stream teams, when we first talk about going out and doing surveys, they get very nervous. Like, am I going to have to go out there with all these meters and give, you know, gadgets and things? And this is really meant to be a visual survey. So certain things you may not be able to figure out when you're out on walking your stream. You may not be able to take the pH. You know, you won't be able to do a fecal coliform count. But you can look for things like this, where there's a pipe discharging. This is pretty obvious that there's a water quality problem or a water quality issue here. You may depending on what time of year, be willing to stick your hand into the river. Temperature is another issue that you can, that you can be thinking about. So there's a variety of things, sort of the, some of the in-stream conditions that you could be taking a look at. And this is probably, as I mentioned before, before the passage of the Clean Water Act, you may have remembered a lot of the communities kind of looking like this. This is below one of the factories where they had um, one of the dyeing for the paper factories. And so depending on what type of dye they were using that day, the, the rivers would run different colors, reds, oranges, browns. And when the Clean Water was act, act was passed in 1972, a lot of these point sources were cleaned up. And there's the Nashua River today, pretty crystal clear and in pretty good shape. Still has some issues. The other thing that happened with the Clean Water Act was that a lot of our um, sewage discharges were also corrected. And our wastewater infrastructure was put into place, such as the wastewater treatment plant down there on the right. But today we're actually talking a lot about what we call non-point source pollution. And this is actually a couple uh, posters from an uh, education campaign out in Washington State that kind of talks about some sources of uh, non-point source pollution, such as dog waste or pet waste, the chemicals and stuff that we use when we wash our cars or change the oils in our cars. Can you think of any other types of non-point source pollution? Fertilizers, Fertilizers pesticides. Uh, this is where we, get, where we get to talk again about our messy bedrooms. You can probably see here in the picture, it's, uh, so some people may react to this slide as, wow, that's, that's a lot of little chaos. But if you think about it, if you think about it from a critter's perspective, 
there's a lot of great little hiding places here. There's, there's vegetation that'll drop down into the stream and help feed the bugs, then feed the fish, provide shade cover, um, helps keep the temperatures down. Kind of gives, you know, even the, the, uh, with the wood and the sediment and stuff, as the water's carving out different niches that the fish can find and the aquatic bugs can find. So having a messy habitat is, is a good thing. But what if you were a fish? What would you think of when you saw this? <laughs> Looks pretty sterile. Pretty sterile. Yeah. What types of problems do you think you might have here? A um, word to hide. What was that? A word to hide. Yeah. You know where to hide? Yeah, no structure to hang around or? Yep, no structure. Yep, and you're running off. Yep. Yep. There could be a lot of things running off. Not much shade either. Yep. The temperatures could get probably pretty hot. And of course, as temperatures rise, the oxygen um, levels go down too. Probably not very fish friendly, is it? No. no. So. One of the things that we've been talking a lot about is the importance of having woody habitat along our streams, or what sometimes fishermen and folks call structure. A lot of that, what we just saw in the pr previous picture with all the trees and things. And what happens is this woody habitat helps, again, carve out different features along the river. By, by placing woody habitat, you help create sediment bars, you help create pools, deeper pools, and um, a lot of ver various features that the macroinvertebrates and, and brook trout and other critters like around here. So these are some of the examples of some of the features I was just mentioning. On this slide over here, we have an example of a small riffle where, again, as I mentioned previously, this is where the area of the stream gets real well oxygenated. Um, <coughs> they have a lot of filter feeders, which are little macroinvertebrates that'll sit there and capture things as they fly by and feed on that. And then, you know, you may have a deeper pool. And often what we see is the pattern is you see a, a pool riffle, pool, riffle habitat as, it, as the stream is moving along. And then in the steeper parts of the watershed, which we do have out, out in this region, I think this is actually a slide from Windsor Jams Brook, you may actually get a step pool formation. So then you have a deeper pool, and then you have a drop, and then you have a pool, and then a drop. So you may even see that type of formation in the steeper parts of the watershed. Another reason why it's good to have, as we mentioned before, is having some of that woody habitat is it gives a uh, fish and other critters protection from predators. Uh, does anybody know what type of bird that is up on the right there? You may have seen some around here. It's a merganser. I mean, they're, they've been notorious in some parts of Massachusetts for really picking on the uh, trout populations. They're very avid breeders and, and eaters. <laughs> Another important feature is having our ability to get to different parts of the, uh, the river system. If you think about it, rivers are like uh, long veins, long linear ecosystems, and fish only have the ability to move upstream and downstream, really. And they need to do that for different parts of their life. Their breeding habitat and their feeding habitat are often different. And they also be, need the ability to move seasonally, as I mentioned before, as the temperatures begin to rise, they're going to want to seek the cold water especially the brook trout. You know, if there's a flood event or a drought event, they want it, the ability to find different locations where they can seek refuge. And then also just the ability to um, repopulate areas, especially if there is, in some cases, you know, you may have a, a t some type of spill that wipes out a population or some type of event that would wipe out a, a segment of the population. And the ability to move back and forth into those areas after that has occurred helps repopulate those areas and also the genetic diversity so Brookie, when she's encountering things like this dam, which actually is the dam that was in Beckett by the um, elementary school that has since been removed. And actually the other slide up there is a culvert in, in Worthington that has since been removed. You know, she was con constantly encountering these barriers and not being able to get where she needs to get. If you think about it, we have a lot of different roads and dams with here in the watershed. I think we estimated that there's over 1,100 stream crossings and I think 114 dams in the Westfield River watershed. So it's a lot of obstacles to, for Brookie to get around. And so this is just a slide to kind of demonstrate what happens, for example, when a dam is put in. You know, here we have the fish kind of moving upstream, 
being able to move all around. And when the dam comes in, it, it blocks them off. And uh, they can't get to where they need to go. And what happens is um, these are like little particles of sediment that the river typically is moving. But because the area gets impounded and the water slowed down, what happens is it starts to fill in. It inundates all the, the great fish habitat and aquatic habitat back here. And it also encourages a lot of, um, well, encourages the temperatures to rise because now you have this just sort of pooled, stagnant water. And then it also encourages the uh, algae growth and other things. And unfortunately, several of our dams, or many of our dams, also can be hazards to recreation and river users. So another important thing that we talked about was having trees and having our riparian buffers intact along our rivers and streams. Riparian buffers provide a lot of different values. And this is kind of just a, a list of them. I won't go through necessarily all of them, but if you think about it, by having vegetation along a stream, as I mentioned before, it actually helps reduce flood potential. Vegetation holds the riverbanks much better than having bare or, or having nothing along the riverbank. Root structures and things, it also provides friction and prevents the dam or helps reduce damage during the storms, helps actually reduce the velocity of the river, provides a lot of great wildlife habitat, helps feed the fish and uh, actually limbs and things that overhang are great places to find turtles and snakes hanging out in the sun. And also pollution prevention is probably one of the most important things is with riparian buffers, it helps filtrate the pollutants before they get to the river. I also mentioned that the river is moving sediment and other materials through the system and it also has a lot of power. And rivers naturally try to distribute that power. And if you look at a river from an aerial photo like this one, you'll see that the sort of winding pattern. And what's happening here is as the river is going around a corner, the power is hitting the edge of that corner and re meeting resistance. And so it's helping to slow it down. And on the inside bend, that's where we often see the deposition of materials and the creation of sediment bars, which are also great habitat features. So rivers are adjusting constantly. They're constantly moving these materials and trying to find that equilibrium or that balance with their energy. But occasionally we get in the way. A lot of our roads and other infrastructure have been built up along our river corridors. And as the river is moving, unfortunately, there's occasions where it may encounter different features. And so that's actually something to be aware of when you're out walking the stream. If you're seeing things like, like actually this is one of the, our stream team photos from our last surveys, a barn falling into the river or an area that's eroding along, along a roadway. It's important to know so that we could try to figure out what, may, what types of things we can do to try to address some of those problems. In a more urbanized area and more urbanized watershed, you may have a lot of impervious surfaces, as I mentioned before, like these roadways and these roofs and things. And what happens is, is that prevents the, the water to infiltrate into the ground and it causes more runoff. Which what do, you th what do you think that leads to? Gives us that sort of what I mentioned, the sort of the storm surge of water during the higher flow events and uh, can increase flooding potential and erosion potential. And also has the opposite effect because it's, because it's sending that water off so quickly it's not allowing it to infiltrate into the ground, so it's also de decreasing our groundwater supply. Another thing that makes a healthy river is how our communities are interacting. Things to be aware of when you're walking the stream. You know, what type of recre recreation opportunities you're seeing. You know, are riverfront businesses um, open? You know, they're kayaking, you know, canoe and kayaking races. You know, are the restaurants, you know, have a view of the river? What is the stewardship of the residents and businesses? I think that was actually the one most impressive thing that we got back from our previous surveys was that there's a lot of great examples of where residents were actually doing some really great things and helping to protect their, their stream and obviously showing signs of respect that they respected, respected the, the river. But occasionally, we, you know, we had one report where there was obviously a use of pesticides close to the river. And it could be just an awareness thing. It, it could be, you know, that they, they're not aware that the pesticides will potentially run off and, and pollute the r river. But in general, you know, I think the, the positive thing was that we got a lot of great reports back from, from uh, our stream team volunteers. So why, why stream teams? Why have river stewards out there? Well, as I mentioned before, we have over 10,000 miles of rivers and streams here in Massachusetts. And there's no way that we'd be able to go out and assess all these rivers and streams. And so 
By having stream teams, we're able to engage citizen volunteers like yourselves in the river and watershed protection efforts. And the information that you gather, we have some examples of some of the executive summaries that came about from our last reports that were shared not only with the Wild and Scenic um, Committee, but with, se with several of the town officials, with other residents, just with some of the other organizations working here in, here in the watershed. And so it allows us to make informed decisions. In the case of the Westfield, they've actually been able to secure some funding over the last couple of years, which have helped feed back into projects that have resulted from some of the survey work that's been done. Again, monitoring the rivers that would otherwise go incest. And I think it's really important to recognize that you are contributing a valuable community service here and, and helping us implement actions that are going to protect our waterways. So talk a little bit now about sort of the shoreline survey. I hope everybody got a copy of the, the data sheet packet. On the front cover, you'd actually see some of these tips that we could be going over in this slide here, talking about the importance of having a buddy. Sort of the safety is, is uh, it's always better to go out with somebody when you're walking on your river segment. Other, another thing, especially this time of year, is to be aware of the water levels. We do not recommend going out after long periods of rain. And, you know, just be aware that this time of year, particularly, we could have uh, rain that can, that can make the river swell up pretty quickly in the rapids, um, pretty intense. So just be aware of that. Wearing proper footwear and clothing, we recommend always wearing, even if you're going to be serving in the summer, wearing long sleeves, particularly because of poison ivy and ticks. And also some, sometimes snag-free clothing. I know fishermen and stuff have a lot of that. There are some briars and things along the way. Consider landowner rights, and we do encourage you to ask permission to cross private lands. Most of our segments we've tried to set up so that they begin and end at a, a crossing or begin and end at public lands, but some of them will be going by private property. We've contacted landowners in the past and have let them know that we will be sending volunteers out there on occasion. We've had a few that have called us back with concerns or have asked us not to have volunteers on the property. We've either eliminated those sections off our, off our uh, segments or we've made notes on what, you know, how they would like to be informed. But if you do see an area that is posted, we do recommend either seeking permission or making a note on your map, and we will go and seek permission from them. But do not, you know, if you ever feel unsure or unsafe, just pull yourself out of the situation. It's more important that for your safety, again, never put yourself in danger um, to gather the survey information. We can always go back and we can always um, work with the landowner or if there's, you know, if there's an area that is inaccessible, maybe too steep or um, maybe you could just feel like you can't get the good footing that you need to walk that section. Just make a note of it and we'll, we'll have somebody either go back and check it out later or find another way to survey that segment. Respect the wildlife and other critters. There's a list here, actually a checklist on things that you can bring along. Important thing is to copy the data sheets. We'll be giving you maps of your sections, both a, what we call a USGS topo and then a photograph or aerial photo of your segment. And never drink the river water. There's a variety of reasons, not to say that the river water here in the Westfield is not clean, <coughs> but there's a, a variety of bacteria that are just naturally occurring that can make you sick. So never drink the water, but always bring some water with you so that you can take a drink as you're getting thirsty as you're walking your segment. And this is an example of one of the maps that you might get. This is really meant for you to draw on. Uh, we have a couple color, diff different color pencils that if you wanted to grab, but you can really mark it up whatever way you want. You might use you know, a symbol like this to indicate where the brooks and streams are coming into the, into the river. And, you know, here you can see on these, the, these lines here indicate where the stream is. But you may find another uh, intermittent stream or something coming in. Might lo mark the location of where pipes are discharging into the river. And uh, maybe where you're taking photographs and what direction you're taking the photographs in. So this, these are really meant for you to mark up. And I guess the only thing that we encourage you to do is give us the key to your symbols because we do sometimes get things back and we're scratching our heads on what they mean. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is when you're surveying, another important thing is you're making notes on your data sheets. What we like you to do is always refer to river right as being river right and river left being river left. And what that means is you're always looking at the river as if you're walking downstream or looking downstream. And that way, when we start reading through the data sheets, um, we get a pretty good understanding of which bank you're talking about. So even if I'm, this is the upstream, and I'm looking upstream, that will always be my river right. 
and then this will always be my river left. It's a bit confusing, but if you can get that in your head as you're taking your notes, it helps us out a lot, especially um, I had one segment last year that came back and he kept referring to the northeast, southwest, north bank, and of course the river segment's going like this. So I'm always trying to figure out which bank he was talking about. So the types of things to take note of, if you flip open to your data sheets, you'll see that we're starting to talk about some of these things. And one of the first things that we have you take a look at is what are the in-stream conditions like? What does the substrate look like? The clarity of the water? Maybe look at the temperature. What are the water levels like? Uh, any signs of a, different things or features for aquatic habitat, any s potential uh, pollutant sources, and just generally what the hydrology is like. So in this slide here, what do you think the substrate right where his hand is, well, how would you, what would you use to describe that? Yeah, sand, silty, mud. Again, as you go further out, you may see cobbles. Cobbles are generally something that you can pick up. Boulders are usually thing, things that you don't want to touch, <laughs> to, but a little too big to, to carry around. Gravels are usually, you know, just a few inches um, wide, and then you get down to, to sort of the silts and muds. In this slide here, what do you see, or what would you take note of? Yep, a lot of turbidity. This is where you get to be a stream detective, and uh, you get to maybe walk up the stream a little bit. Um, see what's going on. In this case, this is on Depot Brook in Washington, and it was shortly after a thunderstorm, and the volunteer walked upstream and found this little drainage ditch that came off the road, came down another road. You know, he, he zigzagged up for quite a ways. And he found um, this driveway that had recently been constructed, and the runoff was coming down the driveway and following the drainage ditch down, down to the stream. Um, luckily, in this case, he knew the, the owner who had just put in the driveway, and he gave him a call, and they went out and they put some silt fencing up. And in that case, they, they weren't anywhere near the river. They were beyond what they called the permitting zone, or the area that you often have to seek permits for. Um, but it was still impacting the river. Why do you think it would be a problem to have a lot of sediment like this in, in a stream like this? Yep. What can happen is it can cover fish up, can cover the fish eggs up, the macroinvertebrates. What do you think you see here? It's actually a, a petroleum product, oil in this case, or maybe this isn't the gasoline. Usually a petroleum product, when you, when you see it on the surface of the water, you'll see sort of this rainbow sheen color. Um, sort of got a rainbow color going off that way. In this case, it was uh, um, an accident where I believe it was gasoline that was spilled. If you came across this, do you think you need to react right away? Typically, yes. There's one thing in this picture that may be a clue that somebody's already been out. You can see what they call as a boom up above, which has been put out to contain the spill and also try to absorb some of the material. But if you did come across an oil spill, a gasoline spill, or you saw an accident happen, usually the first call to make is to the fire department. They're usually able to respond pretty quickly. We've also, our volunteers have gone out after spills to kind of assess habitat and see what impacts it's had. What do you think you see here? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, something even worse. A lot of pollution. <laughs> yeah. This is um, an industrial discharge. And if I told you that it had a high biological oxygen demand, which means that basically the substance ate up all the oxygen in the water column, how would you know I'm telling you the truth? Or might be telling you the truth? Because it's thick. Because it's thick? Nothing's living in there. Yep. All these little silver things are fish. This, this, this charge resulted in a fish kill. So this is definitely something you would take note of. Um, you may not notice that the boom has already been deployed, so obviously it's been reported. You might notice, like, if you did come across this or you knew of a spill that had happened and you're going back and checking it again, you might notice that some of the material is actually escaping from the boom. And in that case, it needs to be re-reported that, that it's not functioning properly. The other thing to, to take note of is you may come across a fish kill. Occasionally, um, natural periods where, um, like especially in lakes and ponds where there's a turnover in the, in the seasons where it results in a fish kill, it's sort of a natural occurring. 
But if you were coming along and finding uh, groups of dead fish along the west field, I'd be a bit concerned, and that would be something I would take note of. What's very helpful is if, if you know the species of fish and the numbers, because that's one of the two questions that you're going to be immediately asked. There's a fish kill hotline, actually, that you would call, and that's what they're going to want to know is, do you know what types of species and how many? Because that helps gauge, you know, is this a really serious thing or is this something that may be naturally occurring? And also figures out who they need to be sending out. And if I didn't know, I could take a photograph or something? Yep, you can take a photograph and, uh, you know, just take some notes. I, I think the other thing is, too, noting locations is important so that, you know, if you're going to call somebody up on a phone that may be coming out of Springfield, you know, it's helpful to give them good directions. <laughs> what do you think we'd have here? Soap suds, basically. This is uh, a stream downstream of a wastewater treatment plant. What happened here was that the wastewater treatment plant got inundated and wasn't able to handle all the soap suds and the phosphates that um, were coming in. And so what happened was it was discharging and discharging those phosphates and things. And it was creating these uh, or bubbles and things and foam along the stream. Luckily, uh, this was slide was taken before the, um, a lot of the phosphates were banned and a lot of the detergents and things that we have here in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, though, uh, there's still a lot of substances that do go into a wastewater treatment plant that need to be treated before being discharged back into the stream. And occasionally, they can malfunction or there may be a storm event where there's the stormwater system leaks into the sewage system and then inundates the plant and they get overrun. So you may see something like this. You may also see, this is more likely the case that you're going to see when you're walking along the stream. Do you think this is something to be concerned about? Yeah? Do you want to know how to tell? It's called the handy dandy stick test. <laughs> if you take a stick and you twirl it around in the water where the foam is and it breaks apart, it's a naturally occurring foam. But if you did that, and if you imagine you had a tub of uh, soap, you know, in a, in a kitchen sink or something, and you were playing with the soap, with like with a wooden spoon, probably all the bubbles would come back together. And those are usually something that's unnaturally occurring, or something that's been discharged into the system. Another way to tell is in this slide, you could probably see that there's sort of a yellowish, brownish tint to the foam. And that's the organic matter that's been stirred up. We often find this type of foam right below a waterfall or a rapid, where the, there's a lot of um, the water's getting oxygenated. So there is a naturally occurring foam. I should have probably mentioned when we talked about the oil, you may actually find little pockets of that rainbow sheen coloring along the river. And you may wonder, you know, is this, is this something I should be concerned about? Again, you can use the stick test. If you sort of stick around and it breaks apart, it's probably something that's naturally occurring. If it comes back together, there's compounds and sort of petroleum products and stuff that kind of bind the substance together. So it would come back together. The other thing to take note of is look around, look over, see what types of land uses are occurring. Are you in the really well wooded area or are you near a gas station? Are you near a roadway? That would help give you some clues whether or not there's something to be concerned about. Is there a house nearby with an oil tank? It's also a bacteria. Well, that's basically the naturally occurring stuff is a bacteria that sits on the surface of the water and creates that coloring. Now, I've talked a lot about sort of this is a visual survey where you get to sort of use your eyes, your ears. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes you get to occasionally use your nose. Can anybody guess what we're seeing in this slide? Yeah. Where, where do you think the sewage is? In the part that it's clumpy. Up here? Yeah. Now, those are actually shopping carts. This is, we call this the shopping cart graveyard. <laughs> The sewage actually is this sort of grayish discharge coming out. You can see how you have the clear water, and then you have this discharge coming out. That's the, where the sewage is being discharged. And often, if you have a grayish discharge, then you probably will smell it also. That's a pretty good indication that, that it's sewage. And if you followed it up, if you went up in the little crack there, you would find a, a stormwater pipe. And what happened was the sewage pipe had burst and it was um, draining out into the stormwater system and then directly to the river in this case. What do you think about here? What types of things would you take note of? 
the cow poop in the stream. What about the soils here? Yeah, the, with the cows accessing the stream, going back and forth, they're eroding the soils, which then are going to wash off into the stream. And what about just the vegetation around there? Probably, probably be better if there was some shade cover. A pretty open area where the temperatures are probably heating up. And you can see, obviously, because of the lack of the larger shrubs and trees and things, that the farmer's been dealing with some erosion because he's see that he's placed some of the stone or riprap along the edge of the riverbank. And there's actually programs out there. We've had a couple of my stream teams work. In one case, there was a farmer. He just he was an older gentleman and just didn't have the time to go out and repair fences. So he had cows that were constantly like breaking out and then getting into the stream. And so the Boy Scout troop got together and worked with him one weekend to, to repair all the fencing. And so there's sometimes some simple solutions. There's also programs out there to help establish alternative water sources and reestablish some of the buffers along the stream and for, uh, in agricultural areas. What do you think we're looking at deer? This one's a hard one to see. It's a little bit blurry. We're looking at the riverbank. Mm -hmm. Do you notice anything? Well, it's actually, it's grass clippings. Yeah. And I'm not sure if he's intending to try to protect his riverbank that appears to be eroding, but do you think that would be effective? No. Probably not. The, the water is just going to pick up the grass and carry it downstream, and if it had fertilizer or herbicides or pesticides put on it, it's going to wash off into the stream. Yeah, so, so in this case, it would probably be better if he was able to establish some vegetation with some root structures some trees and things because the roots will help hold the soils together and bind, bind the soils in and also provide that resistance that I talked about as the river's flowing by and hopefully protect that riverbank a lot longer. And one of the other things that happens is as the grass clippings are decomposing, it's creating what we're seeing here. What do you see here? Algae. Algae. Nutrients can feed algae. And what happens is as the algae begins breaking down, uh, the bacteria that's breaking it down will start using up the oxygen in the water column, and that can result in a fish kill or uh, deplete the oxygen enough that it results in a fish kill. You will see areas, especially during the summer months when the water levels drop, that you will see algae, especially in isolated pockets. What we like to take note of is how extensive is the algae. If you go upstream and you're seeing it right below a pipe, where it begins right below a pipe, for example, that might be an indication that something's feeding from the pipe, some type of nutrients or fertilizers or something that's getting into the stream, feeding the algae. So the other thing to be thinking about is looking at not only what's going on in the stream, but what's going on along the corridor. Looking at what type of land use is occurring, how, how good is the riparian area or riparian buffers? Are there any areas of, of erosion along the bank? Is the wildlife habitat, you know, what type of features are you seeing? What type of wildlife you're seeing? And any recreational opportunities. What do you? What would you say that you're seeing happening along the river corridor here? Yep. Roadway. You got a railroad and you got a roadway, pretty close to the river. This is on the Deerfield River. You also need note that this is a lot of riprap that has been placed here. So obviously they've had uh, issues with erosion in this area. And you know you might take a look at, or you may be very familiar with this area, like I am. This is actually just upstream of where I grew up. And know that, for example, that there's been three or four train derailments over the last several years, and one of them resulted in, in a spill that, that resulted in a fish kill. So you may be, if I'm walking this section, that might be a note that I add, sort of, in the past we've had three or four train derailments in this section. You know, maybe, you know, one of the follow-up actions may be looking at how can we try to prevent that from happening in the future, or, you know, are there steps that we need to take so that when it does happen again, we're, we're protecting as much of the, the system as possible. Same thing with the roadway. There may be an area where you know that several accidents have occurred, and you know that have resulted in spills. So even past knowledge is also very helpful to add into your comments along with your surveys. And did, I, did I mention that we're talking about stream corridor conditions, not the in-stream conditions? Where do you think this house was built? This is probably likely built in the floodplain. You've probably heard of references to the 100-year floodplain or the 500-year floodplain. If you've ever built a house near a river, you may have learned that you need special insurance and there's certain restrictions on how you're building the house. What's 
what's become an issue is that the 100-year flood and the 500-year flood is really a misnomer. Everybody thinks, oh, the 100-year flood only comes around every once every 100 years, or we're only going to see the 500-year flood once every 500 years. But it's actually, it's breaking it down per year in a sense that you only have, or you have a 1% chance that you're going to see a 100-year flood. That's for each year. And a couple of the things that are happening that we're seeing going on, particularly here in the Northeast, is, is that we're, we have um, our records, our G U USGS records that record the stream flows. Like here on the Westfield River, we have um, USGS stations on all three tributaries. But most of those have only been around since the 1960s, 1970s. So we don't even have 100 years worth of data to really calculate out what the 100-year storm is, the 500-year storm is. The other issue that we're seeing is that as areas get more developed, as I mentioned before, we're seeing those larger peak flows as the water's running off the landscape faster. And as a result, the, we're getting higher. It's sort of getting bumped up. And then the third thing that we're seeing happen is with changes in, in the climatic patterns, we're seeing more intense storm events. Um, you probably remember the, the big storm event in 2005, and shortly after, I think, the following spring, we had another series of uh, intense storm events. And then, unfortunately, we're also seeing the other extreme where we're, we have longer periods of drought. So a lot of people, you know, when they look at a 100-year floodplain on a map or a 500-year floodplain, they're like, that's so far away from the river, I never have to worry about it. But in reality, we're, we're seeing that um, reoccur more often. So again, looking at the stream quarter, what's going on, what would you take note of here? Construction. Oh, maybe some construction going on. What about the construction? There may be a concern. Sand and salt. Yep, the sand and salt pile, actually, in this case. It's a highway department yard. And you can't see it, but the, the stream is just off the slide here, going down the hill a little ways. And nowadays, there, a lot of these, these types of highway yards and stuff are required to have the material stored in a contained area or have it covered up um, or at a minimum have it so that there's barriers around it so that if it washes off, it's not going to wash into a storm drain or wash into the river stream. But if you saw something like this, it might, you know, storage of materials close to the river corridor is something good to take note of. What type of concerns do you think this presents for the stream that's located nearby? So it's probably just going to run right off. You get that peak flow. The peak flows we're seeing are eroding our streams a lot faster, too, because it's got a lot more power. What are the things maybe of a concern here? Oil. Yep. Yeah. See all the little oil spots and from maybe antifreeze drippings or oil drippings. Um, all that material will be picked up by the water and washed off. What if it was in the middle of summer and you're standing out in that parking lot? What are you going to be th in your bare feet? Hmm. What are you going to be thinking? Pretty hot, right? Well, what happens is, particularly in the summer months, you could get an th afternoon thunderstorm after this has been sitting outside in the sun all day. And the water hits it, heats up pretty quickly, and then goes straight off into the stream. And that water can raise the, te the stream temperatures pretty quickly. And as I mentioned before, our, our salmon and our brook trout here in the Westfield like temperatures below 68 degrees Fahrenheit. They're cold water species. And so, if those temperatures ri rise above really 70 degrees is really the trigger where we start seeing the fish getting stressed, they can become stressed very quickly. And unfortunately, as I mentioned before, when we were looking at our, our, our flow regime, I mentioned, you know, sort of the rate of change, how quickly the, uh, the change um, can occur in the stream. And since this is a pretty quick um, thing that can occur with a th thunderstorm, it's often not enough time for them to be able to seek refuge in a cold cold water seep or another tributary. And this is usually how it finds its way to the stream, the runoff from our parking lots. As you can see here, this has actually picked up some of the oil material. We've got the, the rainbow sheen going into the storm drain. And then it usually comes out the other end in our pipes. Most of our storm drains nowadays are, are directed to the local river or stream or other water body. You know, I've, we mentioned pet waste as being a concern of non-point source pollution. And so obviously encouraging people to pick up their pet waste is important. You shouldn't be leaving it out where it's going to run off into a river or stream or down the street into the storm drain. Well, one of our stream teams had found that a storm drain was packed with baggies of pet waste. That somebody had, had taken the time to pick up the pet waste, but they disposed of it down the drain, assuming that, probably assuming that it went to the wastewater treatment plant. But in reality, it was just flushing it down into the stream. So 
But in this case, as I mentioned, there's a, on page, I don't know if this has a page five, there is a pipe survey form that has you take a look at what you're seeing coming out of the pipe. You find things like this. And it has you look at things like what color is the flow? You know, is there a discharge of some type? Is it pretty clear? Is there any odor? Particularly if you're smelling sewage again. Is there any algae upstream or downstream of the pipe? Particularly if you're seeing it flowing downstream, there's algae appearing. That, that could mean that there's some type of nutrient that's being delivered. Any sedimentation below the pipe? If he, if he was going out and again on a sunny day and it had been completely dry and he finds this pipe. There's a lot of water coming out. Yeah, there's a lot of water coming out of there. Where is it coming from? Well, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this again is where you get to be, become a stream detective. Um, you might again look at, you know, looking clearly at what type of flow there is. Is there any smell? Um, first sort of red flags may be that it could be a broken sewage pipe. Um, it could be a broken water pipe that's infiltrating into the stormwater system. In this case, it turned out it was a culverted stream. But it's something that when you're out there, you may not realize. You may not see on the map or you may not be familiar with, with the stream coming in there. And so that would definitely be something to be taking note of. Oh, we're seeing flow, and that's unusual during this dry period which still could be a concern because if there's other water infrastructure or sewage infrastructure going through town, there is that potential that there could be a leaking pipe somewhere at some point. So he'd probably play, pay close attention again to whether or not there's any sewage smell or um, any discoloration of the water, um, see if there might be any more concerns. What would you notice here coming right out of the pipe? It's a, it's a different color than, than the stream and sort of got that grayish, um, substance that we, we had talked about before. This is actually a discharge from a wastewater treatment plant. As I mentioned before, occasionally our wastewater treatment plants can get inundated, particularly after storm events where they may have had infiltration from, from the stormwater system into, into the wastewater treatment plant, and they can begin to malfunction. But here, you, you again, you'd find this pipe and you'd mark down that you, know, you had a gray discharge. You, know, you might have talked about the smell that you saw and then again looking around to see if you know any sources, any potential sources. Garbage and trash, unfortunately, you may find in several locations like this. These are good things to note. As I mentioned, the Watershed Association organizes a cleanup. A lot of our stream team members have gotten involved in cleanups before. What's helpful to note is, is it household trash? Or are you seeing large refrigerators and motorcycles and who knows what else? Because um, often we get get like some of the school kids out and you know if they have to move a refrigerator or a washing machine we try to we try to put the national guard or some of the big high school kids on on those types of things but so so be helpful to note what type of trash and location where you're seeing it and or if you know if it's been an area that's had problems in the past where it just seems to constantly be getting um, dumped on there's been a couple strategies that groups have used to try to reduce that You'll be surprised at what type of wildlife you might see when you're out doing your survey. You know, if you turn over some of the rocks and things, you may see some of the macro invertebrates, um, like the one down there in the corner. What are we looking at here? Just eggs. Yep, little sacks of eggs. Can you guess what type of eggs, maybe? Salamanders and, Salamanders and frogs. This is a vernal pool. Vernal pools are basically temporary bodies of water. They're, they're not technically supposed to be connected to the river or stream, but they can typically be found in floodplain areas. And this is the type of time of year that you'll actually see probably the egg sacs still from, from the salamanders and the frogs. You may hear the peepers out and also frequent the vernal pools. Another very important habitat feature because they will only reproduce in these locations. And Anybody guess what we're looking at here? Purple loose stripe. Yep, on this side. Invasive. Yep, an invasive species. Is that knotweed? Yep, that's knotweed yeah. on the other side. A couple of the notorious invasive species here in the watershed. Knotweed, if anybody's not familiar with it, it's sort of like this hollow bamboo. Um, and in August, I think, is when it gets this white flower-like uh, finger projections on the top. You'll often see it along the river or along roadways. And it's just been taking over. As they're sh shooting up, maybe it's this time of year, as the, as the shoots are just appearing, it's, you can actually use it as like a rhubarb in recipes. And so you hear some groups actually like encouraging knotweed pie eating contests and things. <laughs> um, <laughs> a 
lot of different recipes in sorbet is another one, a knotweed sorbet I've had is pretty good. And knotweed, for example, um, has a very shallow root structure. The river can just take it away and erodes away the river bank. Of course, it carries on it carries it downstream where it gets established again, and other patches downstream. It basically takes over the native habitat mm -hmm. um, and sort of competes out with the other vegetation that a lot of our birds or butterflies and things have adapted to. A few species will use some of the invasives, but it doesn't give the biodiversity that you're really hoping for. My next slide talks about a new invasive that we're keeping our eyes out for, and so this will be something if you see anything like this. It's a type of invasive algae known as rock snot, and basically it, it supposedly, I guess when, when this stuff is this filamentous material is flowing in the stream, it kind of looks like toilet paper but it'll completely grow on the bottom of the stream and cover up all the habitat for the aquatic bugs and the fish and, and things and cover up the eggs. And it's not very pleasant to be canoeing and kayaking or swimming near or in. But if you're out on the rivers and stuff, we're also encouraging you to clean your gear to try to reduce the likelihood of, of transporting some of these invasives. This is actually an example of one of our stream team projects where they decided to establish a canoe access launching point. And so, you know, as I mentioned before, if you note areas of recreation where recreation is occurring, any problems with the recreation, that's also helpful for us to know where there may be some issues with trash or vandalism or if the neighbors have complaints. <coughs> uh, but also if there's any, you know, if you feel like there may be any potential areas for improving access, that, that would also be helpful to note. And then you might actually encounter some folks out uh, enjoying the watershed and they're all, always very helpful usually with some really good information. Uh, fishermen in particular though they may not tell you where they're, they're finding their catch or their favorite fishing spot is but they can tell you sort of what they've been observing the health of the river over the years. One of the things I should probably point out is that we kind of have the first couple pages are kind of a guide to have you recall some of the things that we talked about that we'd like you to take a look at when you're out walking your river, river or stream segment. And then the second page, or the page number four, is really where you get to sort of write out what you're seeing. And this is sort of just a narrative description. We actually have a couple check boxes near some of the things that we'd hope you to take note of, so you can kind of check them off as you write, write about them on there. The pipe survey, as I mentioned before. And then on the last page, we have our priorities for action sheet. And this is where you can highlight any of the problems that you've seen. So if you saw a discharge, you saw an area that's been trashed, maybe problems with invasives. Also, any of the assets that you're seeing. If you're seeing some of those good river stewards out there, if you're seeing a good place for recreational access or potential for improvements to recreational access or areas that you think should be conserved for a reason, you can note them there. And then anything that you really think or any recommendations for follow-up actions that you might have. 